get pictures of me in Alaska. And then I think, who is that young kid in that picture? Hey, Keith. Oh, Dana's going to go with you? Yeah. Cool. I said, hey, are you working this afternoon? I need some help pick, to pick up cars. So that's the cost. Tom? Um, I said, you're my only home. hope. I said, you're the only one that's She's not allergic. She's at home. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Brandon? And he said, I could be what time do you need me back. Yeah. That'd be nice. Didn't have his, we didn't have his other one. We got the shower pick. No, we didn't. That was before Brandon. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're going to get started with a word of prayer here and uh, move forward. So let's start. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for uh, the opportunity we have to be here to look into your word. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, um, not only in giving us your word, um, but uh, applying it, uh, helping us to see the, the practical side of your word as we apply it in our lives and see it unfold, uh, the evidence of its truth and reality in our lives. Lord, I pray as we um, walk forward in our faith and as we grow in our spiritual walk, Lord, that we might um, increasingly adopt your precepts, your uh, desires, your the heart's attitudes that you desire for us, the choices and actions that you want us to live out uh, so that we might, Lord, uh, each and every day uh, gain a, a clearer sense of the goodness of what you have planned for us. Uh, thank you, Lord, for this time. I uh, thank you for those that are here. I think of uh, those that are not feeling well tonight, uh, uh, Eddie and, and Isabel, that you might give their bodies healing and strength. Uh, pray for Vina and not feeling well and getting ready for her trip tomorrow. And uh, Lord, that you just might bring her healing as well, help her to feel better in time for the uh, for leaving for her trip. Uh, Lord, others that are are traveling that um, are here and, and normally and not able to, I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, just keep them safe. Uh, we thank you, Lord, uh, for this time that you've given us. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to look into your word. I pray that you would just encourage us, Lord, as we walk through this time together, uh, through the power of your word and its strength to transform our lives. Uh, we just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So there are two ways of handling pressure. Uh, one is illustrated by a bathysphere. The miniature submarine used to explore the ocean in places so deep that the water pressure could crush a conventional submarine like an aluminum can. Bathyspheres compensate with plate steel and several inches thick, which keeps the water out but also makes them heavy and hard to maneuver. Inside, they're not alone. When their lights are turned on and you look through the tiny thick plate glass window, what do you see? Fish. These fish cope with extreme pressure in an entirely different way. They don't build thick skins. They remain subtle and free. They compensate for the outside pressure through equal and opposite pressure inside themselves. Christians, likewise, don't have to be hard and thick-skinned as long as they appropriate God's power within to equal the pressure without, Jay Kessler said. What things in life seem to control us in, a, uh, in, a day, in our daily lives? What kind of things seem to... Yeah, Faith of Charles probably has some good examples there. <laughs> what, what kind of things seem to usurp power or control over us in our daily lives? Mortgage brokers. Mortgage brokers. Can't imagine what you're talking about there. Okay. Others? What kind of things? Arthritis. Our health? Yeah. You know, in a, in a broad stroke, arthritis for sure. Uh, aches and pains, aching joints, sure. Arthritis, our health does. What else? Schedules. Schedules, uh, demands, expectations uh, that are placed upon us. Schedules are sometimes uh, things that we put upon ourselves and other times that are things that are demanded of us. Good. Anything else? Government taxes and stuff. Government taxes, which affect our finances, right? Finances are another thing that uh, tends to, to usurp con control over us. In a sense, it limits us, affects us, uh, certainly impacts our decision-making. Uh, how, does, how does it make you feel when things in life seem to control you? How does it make you feel when things in life seem to control you? 
You got to give me more than a face, baby. Yeah. Anxious. <laughs> Sad, anxious, depressed, depressed <laughs> angry. We're not having a problem popping these up, are we? <laughs> Frustrated, um, upset, uh, sometimes sleepless. Uh, you know, the list goes on. Uh, powerless at times, like you're out of control. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 uh, real quick. And uh, we're going to start by looking at verse 12. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12. It's an interesting verse. Um, so let's, let's read it and then we'll, we'll go from there. Um, all things are lawful for me, Paul says, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, it's an interesting verse. When you just read it at face value, um, that verse seems a little bit strange. So let's just work down through it. What do you think are the key words in this verse? What, if you had to pick key words out in verse 12, what would they be? All. All, okay. And when we talk about the word all, uh, what does it mean? All. All. All, yeah. Pretty, it's pretty all-inclusive, isn't it? I, you're not supposed to use the word in the definition, but anyway. So okay, so that's that's one. What are some other key words? Lawful. Lawful. How many times do we see the word lawful in that verse? Twice. Two times. Yeah, in in short order. Two times the word lawful. Good. Uh, what what are what's what's other significant words there? Okay, there's some personal pronouns there, me and I. I. Okay, so it's very personal. Good. Any. Any, yep. Uh, Which excludes the all, right? All things are allowed, he's saying, but he won't be controlled by any. So as inclusive as, as inclusive as all is, it's excluded by the last phrase. There's one other really key word we haven't touched on yet towards the end. You have the word power there? Okay. That's pretty significant. Um, all of those are, are pretty significant verses there. Um, both words for lawful, look at number four there, both words for lawful and the word for power all come from the same root word that means power. So it's a little bit different aspect of one. One is the, um, is, is the, the power that exists. The other one is the right to use, so to speak. But they both come from the same root word power. What kind of things do you think all things are lawful for me is talking about? Is, is the Apostle Paul saying that Christians are allowed to do whatever they want to do? Sounds that way, doesn't it? <laughs> well, that was an easy answer. It sounds that way. Uh, it does sound that way a little bit, doesn't it? What do you think? All things are within his power to do. If he has the ability to at least try to do everything. But not all of them are necessarily good for him to do. Okay, so let's look at that verse. If we're looking at that as being pow- uh, the power to do, all things are, are within my power, but all things are not helpful. All things are within my power, but I won't subject myself to be under its power. So I'm not going to allow something to usurp its, its effect over me, even though those things themselves, I, in fact, have the power over. So it's as if Paul is saying, look, I've got the power to do whatever I want to do, but I'm not going to allow those things that I have the power to do to be a thing that ends up in the long run controlling me, usurping that control over me. What do you think is the, sh- is the shift in mindset that Paul is going for in this verse, if what we just said is true? Like, it seems like he's seeking a shift in a mindset. What do you think that shift is? From what to what? Well, the verse before it talks about sanctification 
and justification. So he's working out his salvation, what's good for him. We'll keep him on track for the Lord. Yeah, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, as such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And then he goes right into it. All things are lawful for me, but not necessarily helpful. All things are in my, in my power, but I won't be brought under or subject myself to the power of any of those. So before Christ or even in Christ, he has now the power to choose not to do things that before he otherwise had to choose or didn't have the power not to choose. It's kind of a long, backwards way of saying it. Um, in essence, he now, through Christ, doesn't have to subject himself to the control of those things anymore. So he has the right to do anything outwardly. It doesn't mean they're best. He certainly doesn't have to be in subject or control um, of any of those things. Let's look at verses 13 and 14 there as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 13 and 14. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. What is one thing in verse 14 that humanity does not have the power over? And who is the only one this verse says does? In verse 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, what is the one thing that humanity does not have the power over? And who is the only one in this verse that says that this verse says it does? God. God will raise up the body. God's in control. Death being raised. Yeah. Being resurrected from what is dead. Uh, and specifically here in the body. God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. We're not going to be raised up or find victory over the death of our bodies in our own power, in our own wisdom, in our own actions, it's going to take the act of God to raise us up over that. Uh, number six is where we are uh, in the sheet there. Um, let's look at verses 19 and 20 as well. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 or 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Now, does your version say you were bought with a price? Okay. Some verses say with a price. Some say with, some say at. Not a huge difference, but at is more expensive. Because it carries with it, well, it's the original text, it's there. But the, the, the value of it is this. There was a predetermined price, and you were purchased at that price. Not by anything less, and it didn't take anything more. It was a set price. Who do you think set the price of our redemption? Probably not a trick question. God did, right? So we're bought with a price, but it's a set price. It's not a sale price. There's no specials. Uh, it's not Kmart closing. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, so, verse 19, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, with whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price, a price that was set by God. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, that last phrase, and in your spirit, which are God's, is not in some of the more... Um, substantial, more uh, trustworthy texts. So we could really stop it. It really doesn't mention the Spirit in, in, in the most solid uh, manuscripts that we have. So really, the verse would end, therefore glorify God in your body, which is really what the focus of the passage is really dealing with in the first place, 
your actions, the way you live, the things that you do. Uh, you, you have the power, you have the strength to do whatever you want to do, but not everything that you can do is right to do. You have the strength to do it all, but, but um, Paul says he's not going to allow the doing of those things to ever be that which controls him. Uh, he said in those earlier verses, and now uh, the focus on the body, you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God um, in the body. Uh, what do you think ownership in these verses has to do with the verses we already looked at in this chapter? This is, now it's talking about ownership. And it says, don't, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You've been bought at a price, therefore glorify God. What, what does the ownership, we are gods, we've been bought by God through Christ. We're his. Were we his before Christ? I would say, for, but not as much. I don't know. How can you say it? We yeah. were always his. We were created by him. It was still the earth where we were owned by him, but now we've been bought from sin and death and destruction that we were under. So. Okay, and I'm going to come to Joe in a minute. Okay, in, in one essence, we're his because we're his creation. Right. So that in itself um, speaks of ownership. Right. But there's a different level when we come to him in Christ in faith, uh, through Christ in faith, uh, because it says we have now become a new creature. All things are passed away. All has become new. So now we've been transformed um, from just being owned as a possession a creation of his to being something that has been redeemed for a purpose moving forward even yet so we're not just the painting on the wall but we're something that is is usable and purposeful uh and so on so in that sense yeah we were always his and joe you said the same thing but i think you're thinking in a different sense right i'm thinking because i was selected from the foundations of the earth yeah the apostle paul said before the very foundation of the world god chose he predetermined, he predestined us. Um, so that's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, verse 2. And the earth was without form and void. That is the foundation of the earth. When Paul says that before the foundation of the earth he chose us, that's what it means, before that moment. So in, in eternity, before he even started creating, he already predetermined we were not only going to be his creation, we would be, by faith in our history, his, but it was secured in eternity. Eternity passed. We were always his. Aren't all of those, all of us, his creation, which means we're all his, even if, yeah. even if we aren't, even if they aren't Christians, they yeah. are still his. Absolutely. And that's what, I think that's what uh, Paul was saying as well, is that as, as his creation, we are all, all his. When we come to him in, in faith, it transitions us into a, a new part of that creation. We have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we now have the Holy Spirit. We've now been redeemed. We've been transformed from darkness to light. Um, we were once dead in our sins, and our trespasses are now made alive in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul says we've been quickened. Um, all of those those ideas. So absolutely, um, we were. Um, so what do you think ownership in these verses has to do with the verses we already looked at in this chapter number seven? What does ownership have to do with all the things that we're looking at so far? Who did he pay the price to? Okay. It certainly has to do with who the price was paid to. And we he can see... He didn't pay it to the devil. No. He didn't pay it to me. Well, and the first part of that statement is significant. The world has the idea that we are Satan's. We never are. We are destined not by the determination of Satan himself. He faces the same fate without Christ that we do. So the purchasing price does not go to Satan to purchase us back from him. Uh, Satan is the prince and power of the air, yes. 
but he does not have the power to determine the destiny of our souls, uh, the outcome of our souls, the redemption of our lives. So when God redeems us, he doesn't redeem us from Satan. He does redeem us from death, but that death is God's declaration, God's condemnation on sin. He is redeeming us back, not from a person, but from a judgment we're being redeemed back from. And that's significant. Good. Any other thoughts? What does ownership have to do with these verses that we're looking at? I remember the verses uh, 13, uh, 14, uh, verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful or expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I won't be brought under the, the control. I won't subject, subject myself to the control of any. What does ownership have to do with that? We're to glorify God with our life that it isn't ours anymore to do what we want with fornication or what they were dealing with, but we are to glorify our uh, God through our body, which in turn we're letting the Holy Spirit guide and direct us. Absolutely. When you take a look at this, how, how many times from a child um, do you hear, um, it's, um, I don't want to, I'm not gonna, right? And, and, as, and as, as adults, oftentimes we're, we're almost just as bad. Um, we, we like to think that we have the right over our own lives. But if God is the owner, then, then, then our lives ought to be for his glory. And then that begs the next question, does ownership have the right to determine one's actions? Like, I'm in control of my life. It's my life. I can do with it what I want. Right? We've heard that in our culture. Does ownership have the right to determine our actions? Tell me, give me an example of a machine or a tool that you use. Paul, you've got a bike. It's a three-speed bike. Right. And you rode it today. I rode it, yes. And you haven't rode it in how long? A year. In a year. Did it do anything in that year that you haven't touched it? No. Nope. So you climb on that bike. Do you have the right, as the owner of that bike, to determine what it is to do for you? Yes. And is it your power that controls it? Yes. And does it do what you tell it to do? Mostly. And if it works right, you, you came in and shared with us that you rode your bike, if, and it worked right. right. Is that to the glory of the bike? Or does that say something about what you did today? I think it says something about what I did because I Absolutely. used it. Because you used it. Yeah. You accomplished it accomplished. with a cool? tool that you oh. own that you determined the use of. You're talking about an inanimate object. That is true. Wife. She belongs to me. But mm, does she belong to you? She sure does. Mm, I... <laughs> Not in the same sense. Not in the same sense. But in the same sense that... She I belongs to you by the vow that you've taken and exactly. the vow that she has taken. And I belong to God because of the sacrifice he did. And I accepted that. I made a vow to him and he made a vow to me. But yet, my wife will do things that would upset me. But she also does things to my glory to help me. But even the things that upset you might be what God has determined is actually the ultimate good for you. That would, in the long run, bring you glory anyways. Yeah, if you want to stick up for her, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. Hey, but, yeah. she's got lentil soup. i got to stick up for her. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Uh, but talking about a bike and talking about... No, but we're talking about ownership. So if, but, you, if you really want to do that kind of comparison, if we were to believe and or support the horrors of slavery... If we own a slave, do we have the right to determine what that slave does? We do, but, but he also escapes. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We don't advocate slavery. No, we don't advocate slavery. No, not at all. No, but um, ownership, ownership is kind of different when it comes to living beings than it does to a bicycle. Not when it comes to the idea of 
it being created. God's created it. He's created our lives. The very, the, the very breath that we have has been breathed into us by God. Exactly. Um, and interestingly enough, the same term is applied to how the Word of God came about, 2 Timothy 3.16. It is um, all scriptures given to us by inspiration of God. And that word inspiration is God breathed. So in the same way that he brought to life truth through the word of God, he has brought to life our lives and truth in it. He's the one, and, and his ownership of us is just as significant as my ownership of a tool, of an inanimate object. Because without him, I don't exist. I'm... I'm and, and without him, I don't continue. It's not like he's created me and then allow and then and then my existence doesn't take his continued effort for me to continue. But also without me, he doesn't exist. Wrong. Yeah. God is self-existent. If if I was never created and I was never here, there would be no God for me. For you, so but there would be God. There would be no you. But God is be, God. In the no, beginning was God. There would be no me. But God would not be different. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is self-existent. Only to the living. Or no, no, only no. to the created. You're, you're talking, there's a difference between awareness and reality. You're talking about the idea of awareness of God. There would be no awareness of God because there would be nobody to outside of God to be aware of him. But awareness, he's self-existent, he's unchanging, he's immutable, he is the same always throughout all of eternity, before creation, during creation, after creation, even if there was no creation. He would not be different, he would not change. No, there's, there's nothing that would ever change. The only thing that changes is whether or not he's perceived by someone outside of himself. Exactly. But the only people that exist that can perceive him in the first place are those who were created by him. So does God need that perception? Uh, God needs nothing. He's self-existent. He chose, and why he chose to do things the way he did is a question you'll have to ask him when you get there. He wanted um, but he wanted fellowship. He wanted to create something that he would enjoy the fellowship of that would reflect his glory, not increase it, because all glory is his already, but would but would reflect it, would demonstrate it, that he could enjoy. Something that as he participates with it in fellowship allows him to receive back to himself the same glory he gives out. This is almost put in the negative. Yeah. In the sense that it's saying, I can do all things, but some things I just choose not to do. And it's kind of in the negative, but if you twist it around... The things that you choose to do for God and His glory is out of love and out of devotion. Yeah. So it's it's kind of like He's looking at it half empty, the glass. The reality is we only have a choice because He gives us a choice. What's that? I'm sorry? The reality is we only have a choice because He gives us a choice. At any given time, He doesn't want us to give us a choice. He's not going to give us a choice. And that's very true. Because He owns it. Oh. The bottom line is He's the one to create us in such a fashion that, and this is where it comes, you know, people are like, well, then why would God allow evil? Right? I mean, that's the biggie. Everybody. Why would God allow you know, people to do horrible things and people to get hurt by evil people? Why would he allow evil? Why wouldn't he just prevent us from doing that in the first place? Or stop the people that are going to do the evil? But God, is, in his grace, didn't want us to be robots. He wanted to give us freedom to choose, to make choices within the parameters of, of how he's created us. And we can do that. Although, according to the laws that he has put in place, and I don't just mean, I don't, I don't mean commands necessarily, but laws in general, all laws, scientific laws. He puts laws in place that we can experience the consequence of our choices with, like jumping off a cliff, falling out of an airplane without a parachute, you know, hitting your hand, your, your thumb with a, a hammer. I, I mean, the, so, so we'll experience, even by natural law, we'll experience consequences of our choices, but he wanted to give us the freedoms to do that. And that's grace out of his love. He didn't want to, he wanted a bunch of people who had the ability to choose. So he gave us that free will. We exercised it the wrong way, and sin came in and affected our ability then to reflect that glory um, clearly. 
Someone who's unsaved still in part reflects that glory, but not in a way that earns him any favor with God eternally or does anything to detract now that judgment that hangs over our head that demands a price to be paid. We, we can't pay that price. We can still reflect his glory in part outside of Christ, but it's, it's tarnished. But as far as that price, we can never pay that price. But here, Christ did in these verses. And look at verse 20 again. For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. By the way, the idea of the inanimate objects and, and trying to justify where we fit in that, even Scripture itself talks to us about he is the potter and we are the clay. So even that relates us to the inanimate objects that we might possess and create as being under our power to determine how they are going to be used. In that sense, uh, in the very same sense, Scripture is giving us an understanding that God in the very same way has crafted us in the very same thing. Um, and that speaks to the idea of, the, of humility as well. We have to recognize who we are. We're still just his created beings. We're still simply just a lump of clay. We're powerless without him, even in our choices and actions and our abilities. And Christ, even involved in creation, Colossians chapter 1, right? All things continue because of him. So even the fact that my life continues, or the knowledge of my life, or the ideas that flow in my head, or e even my spiritual existence that after my body is gone, continues on for eternity, will for eternity take the power of God in order to continue. It's not a matter of how strong he is that he could stop everything if he chose to, uh, by an act. He could stop everything by stop acting. It takes his power for things to continue. He. You know, if we have the ability to ask him questions when we get there, the question I'll have is why would, why would you have created it this way and it needed to be changed when you had the foresight to make it one way to begin with? Right. That would be my question. Yeah. And, and I don't know. I don't know either. I, and I do know, uh, and, and, the only, and, and humanly speaking, I looked at it and I think to myself, well, he will for eternity have, a, have a, a group of people, God's, the children of God, which will be all that have come to him in faith. So it would be Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, tribulation martyrs, millennial believers. All of them will be the family of God, the children of God for all of eternity. They will all be there because of an act of free will based on his choosing and his working in our minds and hearts. Otherwise, if he, had, if he had created it just to be the right way in the first place, that wouldn't be. So I don't know if somehow that's going to reflect a greater glory or not. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. And I think, uh, um, I think I will either, by the time I get there, not care, or I'll ask him. Because I think you're not alone in, in wanting an answer to that question, because I feel the same way. Uh, what do you think people... Um, and that's the price talked about in verse 20. We know what the price is, right? The price is Christ. It's an eternal, it's, an, it's, it's, the, it's the receiving of judgment of an eternal punishment for sin. That's what's demanded. And only Christ can pay that. Um, and that's in, in verse 20. What are God's people freed from, do you think, in these verses? We're free to choose. We're not. Stuck. I think we're free from the necessity to sin. We sin, but not because we have to anymore. Yeah. Listen to this. Um, I wrote this a while back in the margin of my Bible. Maybe it's wordy. I tend to be wordy. Things that chained you to the bondage of of condemnation before Christ can still hold you back in your spiritual walk after Christ. But you've been bought from the bondage of having to do them. Now it's a choice. And we talked about that before, even with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had the power to choose always to do what was right. They didn't. So they, because of that, a condemnation then was passed, a judgment was already passed 
onto all of humanity, and we all go on in sin. But in Christ, that ability to choose what is right has now been restored. Now I can go on choosing right, if I, excuse the word, choose to. <laughs> um, so we were under the bondage of condemnation before, but we can still, if we go on choosing, now that we've been freed from the bondage of having to choose those things, we can still subject ourselves to the effects of those things because you still can't do those things without the bondage of consequence. There's still going to be consequences there. Let's look at Matthew chapter 11. Familiar verses here, I think. Matthew chapter 11, verses uh, 28, uh, 28 through 30. Uh, Christ here is um, just given the woes to the evil cities and um, talks about, you know, whatever the, whatever the Father gives, gives to me is mine, period. I mean, that's the idea of 25 through 27. Uh, they're mine um, and, um, uh, and, and will always be. And then in verse 28, Christ makes this statement now. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden, my burden is light. What are the two states of existence contrasted in verse 28, do you think? Two states of existence. They may not be stated, but it's at least implied. There's no rest unless we come to Christ. Okay. So the idea of unrest, right, in the very beginning of 28, being labored and heavy laden is one state. It's a state of existence, right? Labored and heavy laden. And what's the other state of existence there? Simply put, one word. Rest. Rest. That's a pretty stark contrast, isn't it? That's a huge contrast. Uh, and they understood the idea of the animals, animals of burden back then. I mean, that was pretty clear. And I think even in our culture, I think we have a, a pretty good concept of, of that. I watched a, a YouTube video. Let's bring it in, in 21st century vernacular. So in a YouTube video, and it had this flatbed low boy trailer uh, and, a, and a big, uh, a large um, track backhoe getting up on the back of it. And I don't know if it was in the Philippines or wherever it was, and they just, it just kept inching up and inching up. And, ev and with every inch that those tracks would climb up onto the back of that uh, flatbed uh, low boy trailer, those the, the tires and the suspension with the wheels just kept going further and further down. By the time you got to the end of the video and that thing sitting in the belly of the low, low boy trailer, it was obvious that trailer and that suspension was not meant to carry that tractor because the, the tires themselves, although they didn't blow out, were so compressed. It looked like the rims of the wheels were against the ground and against the trailer on the top and ovaled out and everything was just squashed right down. That's the idea of that heavy laden and burdened. That's a burden that trailer was not meant to carry, and it was heavy laden, which means that it would have been hard to then pull it because it, 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 was, it just weighed down more than it was supposed to be. Um, so those that take on Christ's yoke, number 11, finds rest for what part of themselves? If you're going to take on the yoke of Christ... That is to, to take upon yourself to pull what God tells you to pull in life. So you understand the parallel between that and, and 1 Corinthians chapter 6, right? That, that all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful, but I won't subject myself under the authority or the power of any of them. I will do all things to the glory of God. I've been purchased with a price, so I'm his. So when you look at that, that's the yoke. Right, that God gives us now to do all things to his glory is the yoke 
that, um, that we put on. So what in verse 29, um, for those that take on Christ's yoke, finds rest for what part of themselves? The soul. Most of the time when we want rescue from hardships of life, are we talking about, uh, what part of us are we talking about most often? Mental, emotional, or physical, which involves the mental and the emotional, right? Um, this verse isn't saying that you're going to have an easy life if you come to Christ. It's not saying that you're not going to go through stresses and hard times. It is saying that you're going to find a rest, and it's a rest with, deep within your soul. There is a difference between um, resting on your couch for me because this is my thing, resting on my couch or sitting watching a sunset on the far side of a lake when the air is still. There's a, there's a deeper peace within me because I'm experiencing the, a beauty there, something that, that gives me a deeper rest. That's the idea of what Christ is saying. It's something that even in the midst of if I was hurting or whatever else, I would still feel better sitting there watching that than just sitting in a, in a room with four walls. Um, so, um, and, and certainly, I mean, it's, it's more than that. It's talking about our destiny, our eternal destiny as well. Um, but, um, uh, but you understand uh, that. So it's, it's for our souls. What do you think the yoke and learn represents in verse 29 then? We talked about the yoke, right? Yoke represents what 1 Corinthians 6 is talking about. That's his yoke, to live or pull things in life the way he's determined and what he's determined to pull. So what do you think learning is, is representing in verse 29? Um, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly. What are we learning from him if we're pulling his yoke? And keep in mind, it's pull the yoke and learn. Take the yoke is to join up, join forces with him. Okay, Join, joining forces, 1 Corinthians 6, like, 6, like we talked about. So that's the yoke. And then what would you say, Edie? I said um, Christ is the example for us to look at how he always did the Father's will. Okay, by example, he's going to be teaching us in that process. What do you think he's going to be teaching us? Take my yoke upon me, upon you and learn from me. What do you think we're going to be learning from him if we're taking his yoke on? Not to worry about the cares of the world. Okay. Not to worry about the cares of the world or the things that we're not any longer pulling. Right? If we're going to use that the illustration that's given here. Other thoughts? What are we going to learn from him? Not to get too upset at everything. Okay. How to let go. How to not get upset. How to do his work. How to better do the work. How to pull right. Be meek and lowly and heart. Okay. And, and uh, how to be more uh, humble, meek, lowly in heart like he is. Uh, what's interesting as well, and Scripture verifies this in lots of other places as well, when we take his yoke upon us, we are going to learn how his yoke is easy we are going to learn more the benefits of pulling that weight and what he has given us to pull in our lives as well. So that as we pull his yoke, he's teaching me about the beauty of that yoke um, or that thing that I'm pulling, the, the things. It's, it's a greater and growing uh, understanding there. Give some thoughts on the idea of gentle and lowly in verse 29. Keith brought that up a little bit. What's the, what do you think is what does it mean by gentle and lowly? And, and uh, let's look at that. I mean, verse 20, I take my yoke upon me, learn from me, for I, God says, or Christ says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. What does that mean that, God, that Christ is gentle and lowly in heart? What's the definition of lowly? That's what I'm asking you. What do you think it is? Okay, not puffed up, not haughty. You think of a taskmaster as being the opposite of this. 
So rather than, de rather than defining it for you, let me just try and give you the, the an antithesis of it, the, the opposite of it, is, is this, this cruel taskmaster who's driving the animal and beating the animal and not nourishing the animal. Right In other places, um, it says not to hold back the grain of the ox that treads it, right? Um, it's the idea of a, of a driving taskmaster. Here, Christ saying, you take on my yoke. And, and what do people say? You know, well, if, if I'm going to do it God's way, then I have to give up all these other things, and it's hard to do, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Sorry about the blah, blah, blah part. Christ says, you take my yoke upon me, I will teach you, and you will discover that my heart is lowly, it's not haughty, um, it's, it's, it's lowly and gentle. It's not like the taskmaster. You'll find a gentleness there and a humility there that doesn't usurp that authority over you in the same way. Maybe even the idea of, of uh, you, you ever watch when there's a, an ox with an ox cart and, and the owner that walks alongside the ox as he's eating the grain out of the bag that's been put you know, around his ears and up by his mouth because they're on a long, long journey. That's the idea of that. Um, lowly uh, and gentle in his heart. And, and because of that, we can, in his presence, pulling his yoke, find a rest that uh, we can't. And, and by the way, the world does not have that. The yoke that we pull in the world takes its, takes its toll. It just takes its toll. Uh, talking with someone this week about a family member that is deep in the drug culture and prostitution, and it's, it's horrific what that person physically at a young age is now going through. It's tragic. The yoke this world offers takes a toll. The yoke that Christ offers gives rest. And it's refreshing. It's lowly and it's gentle. It's not harsh like the world is. What do you think is the difference between easy and light? Verse 30. Verse 30 there he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. What's the, what's the difference between, do you think, between easy and light? Light not being bright and darkness, light being light instead of heavy. His grip doesn't hurt. Okay? His that grip doesn't hurt? That would be his yoke, his grip. And our, the burden is light. The so chores that he has. So he's holding on to us easy, and what we have to carry for him is not heavy. Hmm. And to, you know, follow him is not hard. It should be natural. Yeah. And again, just a different, a different side of, of that same thing. It's, it's not hard to take that yoke upon us. It's, it's easy to do now because of Christ, right? It's easy to take it upon us, and it's never going to represent something that's going to weigh us down like that trailer with the tractor on the back of it, holding us from moving forward. Um, Unless we take his yoke and take the tractor with us. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's what they're saying not to, right? Right. That's, that's exactly what 1 Corinthians was saying uh, not to do. What do you think the children of God are freed from in these verses? The fear of um, a heavy weight of Christianity or do's and don'ts. The phrase you're from the yeah. do's and don'ts. Yeah, we're freed from the law in the sense that the world is judged by the law. And the only thing the world has to offer is a burden that is heavy and harsh and takes its toll. And we have been freed from that, from the law, that the rest of the world will be judged by and have to live by. Um, if you want, a religion of works. We've been freed from that. Both in our spirit, our soul, in destiny, but also in the way that we live. Because even though it's saying that, that, that it's, it's for our spirit here, in our spirit we're going to find rest um, in our spirit, it's talking about yoke and burden as well. So it's not just the spirit, but it's the way that we live as we carry our spirit with us. All of those things. Psalm 118, 5 and 6. We're going to close with this. Psalm 118, 5 and 6. I mentioned this verse last week. Psalm 118, 
verses 5 and 6. I called on the Lord of distress. The Lord answered me and set me, uh, some translations say, in a broad place. Literally what that means is he set me free. He put me in a place that is wide where I, can, where I have the freedom to walk. It's, it's the idea of opening up that which was narrow. All right? So I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do to me. What's interesting is the period comes after fear in the original Hebrew as well. So fear ends a thought. I will not fear. The next statement then is, what can man do to me? It's not, I won't fear what man can do to me. It is, I will not fear. And then the second statement is, what can man do to me? Nothing. Really kind of interesting there. What are three action verbs you see in verse 5? Give me three verbs, three actions in verse 5. Something that's done. Cry. Cry. Cry means to call out to, right? It's kind of like, so-and-so. You know, when you're calling them, you're trying to find them, you cry out to them or crying out for help. Okay? So that's cry. Answer. Answer. Brought. What? Brought. Set. Sought, set or brought. All right? So look at those again. I called to the Lord in what? Distress. Distress. And he what? Answered. And he answered. And he didn't just give me the answer, but he set me free. Free from what, do you think? Now, I know this might have been written about something specific, so I'm not looking for something in specific, but set me free in what way? What do you think? I cried to the Lord in my distress, and he set me, he answered me and set me free. In the context of the verse, he set me free from what? From the distress. What distresses me? The reason I cried out to him in the first place. Isn't that beautiful? And then it, uh, it let's let's answer the questions, I guess, <laughs> instead of me just getting ahead. In a broad place in this verse has the idea of lots of room to steer or being set free. Uh, what was the circumstance that prompted the psalmist to call on the Lord in the first place? He was distressed. Have you ever felt distressed? Don't even answer that because we know the answer. We all have. Why are hard things sometimes so distressing? Feel like you can't get out of it. Feel trapped. Can't get out. It's not enjoyable being there. Feels wrong. Feels like it should be something different. What seems to be the one thing that chases out fear in verse 6? Verse 6, six says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What seems to be the thing that causes us not to fear? The Lord is on my side. That's the part that the, the phrase that has the word fear in it is connected to grammatically. Remember, grammatically, verse 6, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. Period. What can man do to me? Period. And that's nothing. What do you think the children of God are freed from in these verses? Distress. Fear. Isn't that beautiful? Freed, freed from distress itself. John 8, 36. So if the Son, Christ, sets you free, you will be free indeed. John 8, 36. By faith in Christ for salvation, we've already been set free. The Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 6, even though we have been freed to live as we ought, to enjoy the broad place, Psalm 118.5, that God has set us in, often we look to the wisdom of the world without God to guide us and give us answers. When we do this, we willingly place ourselves back under the control or the power of those things that God freed us from, rather than living free in Christ. The joy of participating and being free in the game 
of life rests in the willingness of its players to play together according to the creator's determined rules, subject to the referee's timing for the end goal or purpose of the game. There was an illustration I heard on Robbie Zacharias from, um, from the director of his, uh, um, his institute. And he said, what if you were going to come down to a field and play a game? You don't know anything about the game. And you're on the team. And you join the team and you go out on the field and everybody's playing the game. And you don't know what the rules are. You don't know who invented the game. You don't know why the game exists. You don't know anything about the game or even the object of the game. What's, what's the object of the game? So you're out there and you start talking to the players, but they're too busy playing a game to talk to you. So they're not going to tell you what the, they, they're just playing a game. So you think, well, the next person I've got to talk to is I'm going to go to the referee. So I'm going to go to the referee. I'm going to ask the referee, well, what, what's the rules of the game? And he says, well, there are no rules. You go out and you play the game. Everybody's playing the game. Just get out there and play the game. And that doesn't work. So he thinks, well, I'm going, to go to the co- I'm going to go to the coach. Certainly the coach is going to tell me all about the game and what's going on. And he goes to the coach, and the coach looks at him, and the, and the coach is like too busy just cheering on the people that are playing the game because he's happy because they're playing the game. And he can't make any sense to it. And they're all just out there playing the game. And the coach doesn't tell him what's going on either, and he doesn't know, he doesn't know how to play, what to play, what the rules are, or what the, or, or what the goal is in playing the game. Just like in football, the the idea of the joy of watching football or playing football is all in a structure of of the rules and and the object of the game and how you play and what's determined for the game. And and he says, if you're going to enjoy the game, you you have to know what the game is. You have to know what the end goal is. Are you trying to get across the goal? Are you trying to put it through a hoop? Are you trying to kick it over over the upper? I mean, what's the goal of the game? But if you are willing to understand the game, and you're willing to play the game the way it was designed to play, and everybody out there agrees to play the game the way it was structured, the more unity there are in the way that you play the game and in following those rules and going towards that goal, the more joy there will be in seeing the game played. That's a lot like life in Christianity. The joy of participating and being free in the game of life rests in a willingness of its players to play together according to the Creator's determined rules, subject to the referee's timing for the end goal or purpose of the game. If willing, then the players and spectators can appreciate the freedom of the game as it was meant to be played. On a wall near the main entrance of the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, is a portrait with the following inscription. James Butler Bonham. No picture of him exists. This portrait is of his nephew, Major James Bonham, deceased, who greatly resembled his uncle. It is placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for freedom. No literal portrait of Jesus exists either. But Bill Morgan says the likeness of the son who makes us free can be seen in the lives of his true followers. Ultimately, when we look at all these passages of Scripture, God has given us a burden that is light to reveal to us, as we learn, a heart that is tender, a heart that is gentle and kind, one that frees us to live as we were supposed to live so that we might gain a greater appreciation of the blessings and the benefit that he has for us in playing the game the way he designed it instead of fighting against it. Because the real joy falls in the playing of the game according to the rules of the Creator. God himself. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this time, your word. We thank you for its power to reveal to us uh, what you have established for us in this game of life itself. Help us, Lord, to learn increasingly and, and quickly as we take upon ourselves in place of the world's yoke, yours so that we might experience um, how easy it is to take it upon ourselves, how light it is, that it's not a burden, but a joy instead. Teach us, Lord, as we walk in your precepts. Help us, Lord, to be committed to it and enjoy the freedom that you've given us through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.